In this video, we'll talk to Jorge Ruiz Reyes, one of the authors of What Can Go Right. We'll be discussing how civil society groups can use machine learning to help locate clandestine grave sites. Uh, how did the collaboration between uh, your group and HR DAG uh, come into being? Yes, our collaboration started in 2017 uh, when we invited uh, Dr. Patrick Ball to uh, a talk at um, Universidad Iberoamericana. He talked uh, to students and to professors about the work that uh, the Human Rights Data Analysis Group has been conducting throughout uh, the years. And after that, uh, we had meetings to see uh, what kind of projects we were involved and in, how we could uh, create a possible collaboration. And that's how the project started. We, we, we had meetings and we saw like the different data sets that we had and we kind of uh, brainstormed of the possibilities that uh, we could do with this data. And then uh, uh, Patrick told us then, well, I think we can apply some machine learning to this project. And that's how it started. Then after that meeting, we Patrick stayed for uh, four or three days uh, more in Mexico. And we were just working on, on the model. And that's how we got our first uh, results where it was like a, 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 a very quick and healthy relationship among the organizations. And then, um, how did uh, how did you start to work with Megan as well? Well, I, I knew Megan thanks to Patrick because uh, uh, she was aware of uh, what uh, we were doing with Patrick in, in the project from Mexico, and then uh, we started also talking with her, and that's that's how I I, I met Megan. I, I didn't actually knew her like well physically or 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 uh, until we met uh, at. The rights con conference it was mostly through emails and some quick talks but that's how we finally <laughs> were able to to meet each other how did you find the working process when it was online just through emails was it was it a smooth process or is it is this kind of work easier to do in person i think uh, this kind of work it it can be adapted fairly easy to work uh, online because uh, there are some tools that help us to do this. For example, we have like uh, repositories where we can work uh, on different locations when we, we don't need to be in the same physical space. So that's how we have been able to do it. And luckily, the, the, the most important aspects of the project, we were able to develop it uh, in 2017 while we, uh, were, when, while we met in, in person. But after that, most uh, the majority of the collaboration has been online after 2017 because uh, HRDAG is in San Francisco and Universidad Iberoamericana and Data Civica we are at um, in Mexico City. So yes, we had to adapt to online work since uh, 2017, and and uh, it, it 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 is so. Sometimes Patrick, for example, came to visit us like each each like once a year. In 2018 and 2019, to see uh, new steps or how we were advancing and to to tune some things of the project. Uh, but yes, that's how we have been working actually online and just uh, a few visits visits from from Patrick each year until the pandemic. Uh, but well, um, we were. Very, we have been working online since uh, the, the project started, actually. Can you tell us more about how students contributed to the project? Uh, how do enforced disappearances and involuntary disappearances uh, affect the younger generation? Well, the Human Rights Center of Universidad Iberoamericana, it's a research and advocacy center uh, that has uh, uh, main, researchers, main researchers, but uh, it gets a lot of support from students, whether they are undergraduate or in, in a postgraduate. They can uh, work at the Human Rights Center as voluntary or also, for example, doing uh, in Mexico, we have uh, social services, it's called, where they have to to uh, fill some credits uh, to, uh, so they can be able to fulfill their undergraduate. So that's uh, how we have been re uh, receiving the work from students uh, for this project, the Disappearances Project and the uh, Clandestine Graves Project. We have had uh, over at 20 students since 2016. They have helped us to um, get the data that we are using, well, part of the data that we have been using for this project. For example, 
uh, reading the press notes uh, where clandestine graves are reported, either at the national level, level or at the local level. And they help us to read the notes, to classify the notes. And then when they gave us back, when they give us back the, uh, the notes, we then um, put it in the database and, and use it for the, the, the statistical uh, analysis set and the predictions. And I think disappearances, um, well, the problem in Mexico is that uh, enforced disappearances or involuntary disappearances, it is a widespread phenomenon. Uh, it has been classified like that, for example, uh, for, by international uh, organisms such as the uh, UN Committee on Enforced Disappearances. And right now we have more than 93,000 missing persons in the country. So it's, it is a problem that affects the majority of the states and, and persons from different ages. So I think uh, disappearances have now become uh, a major concern uh, for the, uh, a large part of Mexican society. And uh, I think uh, it affects us because, um, well, <laughs> it is uh, an ongoing problem right it's not uh, we are not documenting disappearances from the past we are, we are documenting disappearances from the past while disappearances are, are still happening right so i think that's how uh, uh younger persons are trying to to work on the issue and, and try to to generate solutions to it how was the outcome of using machine learning in the advocacy strategy different from traditional or non-technological based uh, advocacy? I think, uh, for example, in the Human Rights Center and in Data Civica, we were using more like classical statistical approaches, for example, descriptive statistics of how many graves have been found in Mexico. And that has worked because we, we didn't even have, uh, uh, for, for example, official diagnostics of, of, of the phenomena. But we know that uh, we, are not, we were not uh, documenting the whole universe of clandestine graves that have been found in Mexico. We we have been just able to document a, a small fraction of, of, of the graves due to different uh, factors, right, that affect the, the social production of, of information of the phenomena. So that's uh, how machine learning has helped us. Uh, machine learning helps us to identify places where either official sources or non-official sources are not able to document uh, graves because uh, economical or violence re related or uh, political factors that they don't allow to to document uh, graves in certain places so that's how machine learning helps us uh, is or is helping us uh, it, it helps us to identify new possible places where we can find more graves or where we should be conducting more uh, search strategies and, and and yes, uh, it, it definitely has helped us in a, in in the advocacy because we have been able to provide, for example, policy briefs or policy reports to authorities, but also to groups of families with missing persons to assist them also in in their advocacy processes. So uh, it is it is uh, a way in like uh, technologies can support uh, the work of of these groups uh so what are you working on now and um what are the next steps well we are still documenting clandestine graves we are trying to develop uh different uh, models that uh, can support the search strategies of authorities and and groups of families with missing person right now we are focusing in on more specific regions of the country because uh this first uh, machine learning model that we have uh developed with hrdag and data civica it was uh or it is a model that predicts municipalities in the whole country right but now we are developing uh, specific models for for example certain states in the in the north of mexico uh where where we are identifying regions within those municipalities right so we are uh making our predictions uh, the the area the geographical area it's like uh, we're narrowing the area because we are now using, for example, also satellite images and other uh, geospatial approximations. So we, we are uh, now identifying like more specific uh, regions within the states or municipalities where we believe we can find uh, clandestine graves. So we, are, we, are, uh, we, are, we, we now have uh, new results for these and we are also uh, showing these results now to authorities and and to groups of families 
So that's what we are doing, and we're still documenting disappearances and trying also to support uh, the documentation processes of groups of families with missing persons because, uh, well, they have a lot of information, but we need to find ways to uh, to help them to structure this information, to organize it, and also to keep it safe, right? So that's uh, what we are also doing with the groups of families. Do you have any advice for civil society groups that are facing similar challenges and are planning to use similar strategies? And is there anything that you wished you knew before you started the project? Well, I think my advice is uh, to try to find collaborations with different um, organizations. Um, it's it's better to work in, in group. I think uh, since 2016, I, I don't remember any project where it was only the Human Rights Center or, or only Data Civica. We have been, uh, all of our projects are uh, projects with two or three organizations because we, we have different strengths and weaknesses. But uh, by working together, that's definitely how we have been able to, to produce relevant results in, in a small fraction of time. And I think also don't don't be like shy or don't be afraid to reaching like these organizations that sometimes they have like big names, but they are actually very nice people and very kind people that they want to help, right? They that's how we met uh, HR DAG and and Data Civica. So I think that's uh, that would be my advice, and also to to document as much as you can with the tools that you have, you know. Uh, it's it's also it doesn't matter if you have like the most advanced technologies even if you only have some notebooks uh written by hand or uh, a common spreadsheet uh there there will be persons that will be able to help you to make sense of, of that data you just have to document and document it doesn't matter how you document and some things that uh, i wish that i would knew i don't know <laughs> um mm, well, maybe some of of the tech, of, of of the statistical approaches that uh, now uh, we have been able to learn, but I think it's also part of the process of of, of working together. So I think it's just, um, uh, uh, yeah, just have like good definitions of what you're trying to do, good methodologies, and document as much as, as you can. And by working with a team. Uh, uh, you're going to get the solutions. So I think that's, uh, that will be my advice. <laughs>